We are uh, grateful that Pastor Matt has had that opportunity to be in Turkey. He will be back with us next Sunday. He is flying home tomorrow. So if you will be praying for him in his travels home, and he should be around here Tuesday, Wednesday, sometime in that, but he will be here with us next Sunday. He finds himself, uh, I think he, he recorded that video, even though he said Resin, I think he was in Istanbul when he recorded that video, but he might have been there as well, but um, he's in a difficult place. That's a difficult part of the world. Um, it's a, there's a lot of great uncertainty that exists in a place like Turkey and in a place like, uh, like the Middle East. Now today, as we begin our series on 1st through 3rd John, um, we're going to be looking at um, what, what we do in times of uncertainty, in, in a sense. Uh, you know, it's interesting, Pastor Matt, uh, right now, although he's leaving tomorrow, but right now, he is not far from where the book of 1 John was written. Uh, just so that you know, today is an introduction. So we're working toward, next week we will go verse by verse through the first four verses of 1 John, but today we're going to give some background so that we just know where we're at and what we're doing and where we're going. Uh, the book of 1 John was written in Ephesus. It's that city in red there on the left of the map. You can see if you go just about due north, you will hit Istanbul up there. Uh, that's where Pastor Matt is. We believe that 1 John was written in Ephesus, so not very far from where he is right now. It's likely that this book was written some 60 years after Jesus rose from the dead. That would make John, the writer of the book, about 70 or 80, somewhere in his 70s or 80s. Uh, depending on how old he was when Jesus rose from the dead, he was probably a young man. To be 70 or 80 during that time was almost unheard of. Most people died in their 40s or 50s, and so to live that long, it gave you some sort of uh, credential that other people didn't have. Gave you some sort of honor. So John, as he's writing this letter, is writing as the elder statesman of Christianity. You have those elder statesmen in your life, whether it's where you work or in your family, that person that you gather around to hear from, that's who John was. John is the last living disciple as he writes this book. The other disciples have all died of martyr's death. John did not die a martyr's death. He ended up dying of old age in Ephesus. But just being in Ephesus, it wasn't as though that was his retirement home. He never retired. He kept going. All right, he may have been old, but he kept working. And he writes, and as we read this letter, we read and, and we'll understand that there's a deep sense of responsibility that John seems to have for the, for the church, a care that he has. He writes about doctrine. He tells them how important it is to believe what is right. There's a story about John that he went into a public bathhouse with some of his friends. And as they went in there, there was a false teacher by the name of Serinthius that was in there. And when John saw Serinthius, he got his friends and immediately ran out of the bathhouse. And they said, what are you doing? He said, listen, we don't want to be in there when God, God gets angry and causes that thing to fall on that man. All right, so he cared about doctrine. And I think, I'm hoping that that was said with a little sense of humor, but he may have been dead serious too, I don't know. He cared about doctrine. He cared about what was being taught. But he also had this care for the heart of people as well. There's another tradition that we have of John that when he was older and was unable to walk himself, he would have himself carried. He would have himself carried into the Christian meetings, whether it was at someone's home or in another uh, facility or something like that. He would have them carried to wherever that meeting was. And when he got there, he couldn't say much. He was older to the point where just speaking was hard, but he would keep saying over and over again, little children love one another. He cared deeply about the heart of those who were a part of the church. So in John, as we read this, there's this deep connection between doctrine and how we live. There's a deep connection between doctrine and behavior. Too often we separate those things. We go to all of the Bible studies in the world and we learn all of these things and we have all of this great knowledge, but we don't do anything with it. It doesn't affect how we live. Or we come on this side and we just love everyone. and We're just going to affirm you, love you, hug you. We will hug you and tell you everything is great. And you can do whatever you want and we will smile at you. But we're going to just stay away from the doctrine. We won't stay away from these things that cause us difficulty. John brings them together. John says, this is how you live. You bring doctrine and the heart right together. And so that's why I think one of the reasons this letter is so helpful. Uh, sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, I come to a passage and I read through it and I'm like, I don't know why I just read that. 
I don't know if this happens to you, where, where you get to a passage and you read something and you're like, mm, can't, I, I just cannot do much with that. You know, whether you get to like a portion of Nehemiah and you're reading about a, uh, the genealogy and you're like, that's, that's great, thank you. I know everyone who is with Nehemiah. I don't know how that's going to affect my life. For me, it's when I'm reading through Leviticus. You get to the certain part where it's like, you can eat this, don't eat this. Don't eat the rock badger. That one has always thrown me off. You're not allowed to eat the rock badger. Why? Right? And you get there and you read that and then you move on. And, and you're like, that doesn't seem to affect my life in that moment. Sometimes uh, you have to mine those things. You have to study those things. You have to work through those things to understand how it applies specifically to your life. Then there are other times where you open up your Bible and you start to read and you think that whoever was re- writing this was writing it right for you in the exact moment that you are at in life. As I was studying through John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, uh, I kept thinking, is John, is John in the next room? Is John watching the same newscast that I'm watching? Does John know what the Christian church is dealing with here in America? Does John know what's going on? Because it felt like and it feels like as we work through this together, I hope it will feel like this to you as well, that John was writing for us. That John was writing for us in this moment, in this time. We feel sometimes that we're attacked. We're, being, we're in a world uh, where we're told that up is down and down is up. Now we're being Things that were never questioned, never questioned in the past, suddenly are fair game for everything. And so some of us are reeling. You're reeling emotionally. You're reeling intellectually. You, you think, how can people believe certain things? And aren't they thinking the same way that you're thinking? And so you're just, you're just it's almost like you're shell-shocked. Some of you, you worry so much for your children. Oh my goodness, how will I help them grow up in a world like this? And so we have these fears. And what we will find as we work through this book together is that the fears that you may have are the same fears that John was dealing with then. What we think is new to us in reality is only new to the American church in the past 20 to 30 years. This is something, these are things that the church, the Christian church has been dealing with from the beginning. Because the truth is that the church and Christianity has always been under attack. And a lot of times the attack can come from within. When we went through Galatians, we talked about how Paul, Paul would say things like, uh, or or Paul came against the, the, the false teachers that were coming against the church of Galatia seemed to come from the Jewish side of the faith. And they would say to people, it's good that you believe in Jesus, but to believe in Jesus fully, you also have to be a good Jew. And so they were adding to the gospel in that sense. This is what you need to do. And Paul said, no, no, it's about Jesus. And it's about Jesus and it's about Jesus. It's not about these other things. John is dealing with a similar attack, but it's coming from the opposite side. It's not a Jewish believer attack, but it is a Gentile believer attack. And they are coming in and they're saying, listen, It's not just about knowing what you know about Jesus from Scripture and what others have told you. We have other knowledge. We have other things that you have to have. And John, just like Paul, is going to say, no, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus, it's about Jesus. And that's where he is going to fall. And so this morning, as we start to really work through uh, this book, we have to start by understanding, why is John writing this? You know, John is writing this, and we're told in in 1 John 5, 13, that you may know that you have eternal life. He wants to give people confidence because their belief is under attack. And it's under attack by a group of people called the Gnostics. Sometimes, if you're in Bible studies, some people might want to sound smart, and they say, well, this is really uh, from the Gnostics, from the early church time. And you're like, the who? Right? The Gnostics were a group of, uh, it's really hard to define them in total, but they were a group of philosophers, of thinkers, and of religious people who believed that salvation came through possessing a special knowledge. And so when Gnostics then came into the Christian fold, they would say it's not just about knowing Jesus, but you also have to have a special knowledge. And so they would say that salvation came through possessing a special knowledge beyond what Scripture taught. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And so they were all about being smart. They were looked at as being intelligent, as being the smarter people of the time. We would look at this and think it's a little far out there and it's almost cultish, but back then they were accepted as the academics, the thinkers, the important people. 
And so this belief then is what John is dealing with. And it works its way out in three specific ways that we will kind of sense as we go through the book of 1 John. Now I should say, there's so, we could, you, you would leave, but we could talk for hours on Gnostics. And we don't want to do that. All right, I'm going to give you three of their main tenets. Some of you may have read about this and you're going to want to talk to me later and tell me what I missed. I understand I'm going to miss things. But we're going to go with three important things. The first is this, that the physical world is evil. That the physical world that you see is evil. Now there is a sense in which Christian belief falls in line with this, right? In the book of Genesis, when there's a fall, uh, when sin enters the world, we understand that sin has stained every part of creation. All right, that in some way sin has, has its effect on what's going on around us. Paul talked about the days being evil. He said we have to work to redeem the time. John will tell us in this book, don't love the world or things in it. So there's a sense that we want to be drawn to this idea that the physical world is evil. Sometimes we get in our little Christian huddle and we talk about how bad the world is. This is terrible. The world is terrible. I mean, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Did you watch the news? Do you know what this? Do you have any idea what my neighbor said? Do you know what my uncle did? All these. And we talk about how bad it is. And then we say, but it's okay. It's, it's bad. It's an evil world. But one day it'll burn. And we, and we, we find some sort of comfort, some sort of strange comfort in knowing all of this, though, it's going to pass away in fire. We won't have to worry about it anymore. All right? And, and, and that, in a sense, is, is kind of a Gnostic thought that, oh, just forget about the world. The world is evil. And where that really becomes a problem is when you start to talk about Jesus. Because the Gnostics taught that anything physical, all things material, had evil in them. Well, what do you do then with Jesus? Because we believe, and we sang about this, we believe that when Jesus came to earth, he did not come as the spirit being that just existed and looked like a human. Jesus was a real boy. Jesus was a real man. He was a real person. He had flesh. If you cut his flesh, he bled. He was real. And so how did the Gnostics deal with that, this idea that Jesus was both God and man? They would separate those. And they would say it would be impossible for God to have anything in him that would be evil. And so if we're going to hold to that in its entirety, then Jesus could not have been human. And that becomes incredibly problematic. Because if Jesus isn't human, then his sacrifice isn't enough for us. Then he didn't really live a human life. He just lived this kind of pseudo-human life. So in separating Jesus' humanity and divinity, you, you destroy the very thing that makes Jesus an acceptable sacrifice. And John will point that out. But this was the popular way of thinking. This is what everyone was drawn to. And so if you didn't want to be laughed at at a party, if you wanted to be looked at as smart, if you wanted to be understood to be in with the times, then this is, of course, what you would believe. Do we not live in a similar time where people will say, if you really want to be looked at as respectable, if you don't want to be laughed at in academic circles, if you want to be accepted into the in crowd, you kind of need to water down what you think. Don't talk about sin. You know, don't talk about what the Bible might say is right or wrong. Don't talk about those things. Talk about things we can all rally around. Water down that important stuff and just stick with things in the middle. Stick with things that are easy. This is easy. This is more culturally acceptable. But it's the way of folly. And Proverbs says that the way of folly leads to death. There are many churches, there are many denominations that have gone this route that have decided we don't want to deal with the difficult things. We're going to water things down so that it will be acceptable to all people. And what happens? No one comes. No one comes because something like that isn't a draw to people. What people want to hear in the end is the truth. They want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear what you have to say to make them feel good. They want to hear the truth. Scripture is the truth. The second problem that we have out of Gnostic teaching is this, that the creator may not be trusted. And I call it the creator, I don't even say God, because the way they explain this, uh, the creator is so far removed. He created, 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 and then this person created us. I mean, it's so, it's this pantheon of different creations and all these kinds of things. But the ultimate creator can't be trusted. The ultimate creator doesn't know what's best for you. The ultimate creator really should be rebelled against. All right, and this line of thinking is something that occurred then and it really has flowed throughout of history and it, and it kind of pops itself back up every so often as being the popular thought. We see it in movies and in media a lot in our culture. Ed, our music director, helped me to see this this week as we were talking through this. 
But a lot of, uh, of the films and even television shows that we're drawn to have this line of Gnostic thinking to it, that the creator or the ultimate authority is the one that should not be trusted. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of films, not to tell you, like, go home and burn them if you have them. All right, but we just sometimes need to understand what the thought process is, process is excuse me, behind what we watch. Uh, when I was young, all, everyone was watching The Matrix when I was in high school. And that was a Christian film, I was told. I don't know if you know that. Many people were saying, Matrix is a Christian film. Because look at the beginning. They're like, you can choose one pill or the other. Do you want reality? Do you want the Jesus pill? Or do you want to take this other pill and go down the rabbit hole of your own self-existence? Da -da -da. And so there were people that were using that. We'll show this Matrix, then we'll have a Bible study. And there are themes that you can draw out. But as that trilogy became more developed, it became very clear that what we have was not Christian thought, but Gnostic Christian thought, where the Creator isn't to be trusted, the Creator isn't to be thought of as good, is to be rebelled against. They do not know what is best. They do not know us. Some of you saw the movie Noah a couple of years ago. I saw the movie Noah. Uh, the only thing biblical about Noah is the name Noah. Uh, if you saw the movie, there's, there's nothing else biblical about it. There's a man named Noah, there is a large boat, they may call it an ark, and there's water. Those are the only three things I could find. I saw the movie, there's like rock monsters. There's rock monsters in the movie. I went looking, and I could not find them because I thought this would be a great sermon on the rock monsters of Noah's time. Didn't exist. But what was in there was a, a pervading Gnostic thought that... The creator was wrong, that the creator I instructed Noah to kill his family, that the creator was somehow just arbitrary, just without reason, angry at his people. He wanted death and destruction, gave no reason for what was happening. Very, very, very different than the biblical account. But it pervades our thinking. It gets into our thoughts, and it's in our culture today, isn't it? God didn't know what he was doing when he made me. God doesn't know who I really am. How I was created is not how I am. Somehow there was a mistake made. We, we latch ourselves onto this in our culture and we start to listen and we start to believe. That's a Gnostic thought. Then the third one, I mean, we, well, we sang about this today, though. We, we sang uh, so often, I do want to make this point, so often we buy into this idea that God isn't good, that God doesn't love us, that God has forgotten about us. But today we sang that he's a good, good father that we're not forgotten, that we're loved by him. And that's the truth of what John will get at. The third idea is that salvation requires special knowledge. It would not be enough for you just to know what the gospel said, but someone else would have to come along and share with you exactly what you don't know. There's little pieces of information that you just don't have. You're not going to find it in the Bible. You're not going to find it on your own. I, being the purveyor of special knowledge, can give it to you but you see, if I have that kind of power, I have a lot of power. If I'm the one who has the special knowledge that you need in order to know that you're saved, you're going to move heaven and earth to make sure that you have that. So people were making a lot of money on this. And they were saying, you need to have extra information. You have to know more. There was more to be learned than just the gospel. We get this from time to time. Someone may, uh, with their heart uh, meaning well, they may knock on your door with a different book or a, a handout and say, what you, what you think you have, you don't have enough. Here's another testament about Jesus. I always say, well, I have two. That's all I need. I really don't need yours. I don't believe that it's, it's another one. All right? But there's people who will say, we have additional information. Sometimes it comes from within the church. It's good that you believe in Jesus, but tell me how you vote. It's good that you believe in Jesus, but do you care about the environment? It's good that you believe in Jesus, Right? But are you caring about this social justice issue? Now, all those three things can be important, and I think in a lot of ways our faith should inform how we do that. But when we start telling someone, you can't really love Jesus if you vote for that person, then we've gone down the wrong road. All right? And we are telling people that salvation requires some additional kind of special knowledge. This is what John's dealing with. This is what his people are dealing with. People who are doubting their salvation because they're drawn to a different Jesus, a more culturally acceptable faith. He's dealing with people who are questioning the goodness of God. Does God know what he's doing? Is he even out there? And he's dealing with people who are uh, being told that there's more to the story. So these people doubt. And then John, John writes this letter, and in chapter 5, almost at the end, he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. 
I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. It tells us two things. Number one, it tells us that there were people in this early church setting who had doubts. Sometimes we're told that we shouldn't have doubts. And so we feel guilty, there's shame, oh, I, I doubt and I'm not, a, I'm not a real believer, I'm not as holy as they are because I have doubts. That is so far from the truth. When we have doubts, we deal with those doubts. We, we lean into those doubts. We, we struggle through those doubts. But people have been doubting forever. And doubting is okay. But then John also tells us, you don't have to. You can know. You can know. And so for these three books, these three letters, he's going to outline, how can you know? And he's going to do that in three tests that I want to move through pretty quickly. First is this. We'll see that there will be a belief test. Do you get Jesus right? Do you get Jesus right? In, in one verse he says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? When we sang the song Overcomer, or Overcome, we talked about we would sing to Jesus and then we would sing to Savior. Savior and then Jesus. When I was growing up, the phrase Jesus Christ to me was a first and last name. I just thought that was his name. That made sense to me. But it's not. All right? Jesus is his proper name, is his given name. Christ is who he was and what he did. Christ means Savior. It means promised one. So when we read about that, we're reading that Jesus, the man, was Christ, the Savior. He was one. So when John says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He's saying, if someone says that Jesus the man is not Jesus the Messiah, that they're a liar. And what he means by that is that people would walk around and say, listen, I don't believe that Jesus the man was Jesus the Christ. There's a different way of seeing this. He's saying, for those people, they're also saying that they're believers. And in saying that, they're lying because they aren't. John's older John has that kind of freedom to just say whatever he wants. He doesn't sugarcoat that. He doesn't say these people are misinformed or that they misspoke or that they were confused or that they were wrong. He says, if this is what you think, if you believe that Jesus the man is not Jesus the Messiah and you say you're a believer, you're a liar. That's it. There's no room for discussion on this. If you don't have Jesus right, you're not a believer. So John is saying, Please stop calling yourself a believer. Please stop calling yourself a Christian. John sets up time and time again in the letter important truths to believe about Jesus, that he's the Son of God, that Jesus was, made, was with the Father for all of eternity, that he was made manifest, that he had a human existence, that Jesus' blood cleanses us, that through him we receive forgiveness, that he's the Savior, and that he laid down his life for the church. He's saying that one of the first important steps when you doubt your faith is to look and understand what do you believe about Jesus. What do you believe about Jesus? Do you want to know if you have eternal life? What do you believe about Christ? This is where it begins. The other two tests are external, dealing with what you do. Those things can be manipulated, but what you believe in your heart cannot. And so you have to have an honest conversation with yourself. What is it that I believe is true about Jesus? And here is the simple way to get Jesus right. The simple way to get Jesus right. Stick with scripture. Stick with the Bible. Read your Bible. Be invested in Bible study. This is the simple way to get Jesus right. If you are getting your information on Jesus from a history channel documentary or from the Bible on TV, some of these things might be fine, but if you're getting your, your biblical or your, your knowledge and what you believe about Jesus from those things, that's not good enough. You stick with Scripture. Sometimes those things help us to better picture this or give us information that maybe we had not thought of. But when they're telling you something different, go here. Don't come and say, well, I read the Bible and then I read the Da Vinci Code. And I have, I have some thoughts. Well, let's talk about those thoughts. I mean, you can come and say just about anything to me and I'm not going to laugh at you and send you out of my office. But what I will say is the Da Vinci Code, while being wonderfully written fiction possibly, is not where you go to know more about Jesus. You go to J Scripture, what God gave us to say, if you want to know more about Jesus, here it is. This is where we go. After we deal with that internal question, then we start to deal with the external question. The second test is a behavior test. How do you act? 
1 John 2, 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So now you have people who are saying, I am a believer, but what I do doesn't matter. When I grew up, uh, I grew up around the phrase, once saved, always saved. Some of you may have heard that. And I believe that, that concept, that when, I, when Christ has saved me, when I am safe in his hand, I can't be pulled from that. I can't pluck him. No one can pluck me from his hand. We sing about that from time to time. But some people use it to say, hey, a long time ago I said a prayer and I meant it. I can do whatever I want now. I can live whatever way I choose because, you know what, once saved, always saved. I, my salvation is basically fire insurance. I can do whatever I want and I'm still going to go to heaven. Paul talks against that. And here, John, in this whole book, is going to say, no. If you love him, you're going to obey his commands. You're going to follow what he's asking you to do. Our behavior matters. Paul talked about fleeing from sexual immorality. Peter says we should put aside malice, hypocrisy, envy. Jesus says to love your neighbors. Our behavior matters. Our behavior does not save us. But if we are saved, then our behavior should change. So here's the behavior test. Does our behavior, does your behavior, your pattern of behavior, reflect someone whose heart has been changed by Jesus? Will you make mistakes? Yes. You will sin on a daily basis. You will find yourself drawn into temptation. You may uh, struggle with a certain sin un until you find yourself in heaven. But the struggle, the struggle is what is important. If, on the other hand, you continue to commit sinful acts, knowing that it is wrong, without care, without guilt, without any kind of shame, then John would say, Scripture says, and I will say, you have cause to doubt your salvation. If you are to the point where you can do something and say, God, I don't care what you say. I know what's best for me. I'm going to do this. Then why do you think that your heart has been changed by Jesus? Now, some of you are going to go into some spiral of depression because you, you do, you, you know, you mess up and then you get better and then you mess up again and you get better and you mess and you're going to think that this is the path. No. The pattern I'm talking about is one that doesn't involve struggle. It involves entire surrender and giving in. If you are struggling in your sin, that is a noble struggle. That is the Spirit working in you to help you fight that. But if you're just giving in and you're ignoring it, then, then why would you think that He lives inside of you? The last test is this, the brotherhood test. And it comes down to this. Do we love like Jesus? John talks a lot about love. And in 1 John 4, 7, he reminds us to love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. He says love. And in like 30 words, he says love three times. Whenever a word repeats itself, it's important. John is saying that if you want to know if your faith is genuine, then you check your heart. You should have love for other people. You should have a love specifically for other Christians. Now, sometimes we excuse this very easily. I'm just, I'm just not a person who's very loving. People annoy me. I'd go to church more, but you know what? There's people there, you know, and I can't handle it. And so, so we go, we, we get in this cocoon of thought where we're like, you know, I love Jesus, but I just, I'm ready to see him and not my neighbor. And, and we get this mentality. Uh, and we think that that's okay. It, it isn't. It isn't. If, if God has changed us, then we should have love for all. I mean, that's clear. But what John is saying is that the love that we express as believers for one another should be something that the world would look at and just be amazed by. That, that the, the, the problems that might exist within this body should melt away because of the love that is in our hearts for each other. Jesus loved us, and then he, he loved other people. And that should just blow us away to the point where we just want to get to know this other person that Jesus loves. I just want to know more about you. I don't understand you. I, I really, three years ago when I didn't know Jesus, I probably wouldn't like you, but I need to know more about you. Now, does this mean that you will walk through with just this happy face at church all the time and no one will annoy you? If that's what it means, then I need to resign. All right, I'll be honest with you. All right, because there are times where I'm here and uh, there's little children. We love little children here, but there's a nursery school. And sometimes they're a little loud and I close my door. I'm like, hmm. You know, I'm trying to study here. I'm doing the work of the Lord, and there's kids going to the bathroom, you know. I get annoyed. Annoyance will happen. 
All right? But is that hatred? Y- you know the difference, right? It, annoying is I, I don't like it when my neighbor drives over the part of my lawn that backs up to his cement. That I'm annoyed by that. Hatred is I hate my neighbor. I want them to die because they drive over my grass. Now, we chuckle at that, but churches are full of people who used to talk to one another and now won't even make eye contact when they walk through the hallway. And that's beyond annoyance. That becomes anger. And that becomes hatred and that becomes rage. It's full of people sometimes who are hoping that someone else in the body falls on hard times so they'll get theirs. So somebody here probably today needs to find someone and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I've harbored resentment and hatred and rage in my heart and I know that I shouldn't. Will you forgive me? Stuff like that needs to happen all the time. But that then becomes an element and a picture of love. Love is coming to someone and saying, I've messed up. Will you forgive me? I haven't thought of you the way that I should. Will you love me back? That's what we need to be about. And when we are like that, the world won't know what to do. The world doesn't know what to do with people who just love unconditionally like that. And they will be drawn to this. They will want to be a part of this because they will see how we love one another. Three tests, three tests that John gives us that we're going to kind of unpack as we go through this book together. The belief test, what you believe about Jesus is important. The behavior test, how we live, do we live like Jesus? And the brotherhood test, do we love like Jesus? Uh, Our culture and our world, and I think our our nation, I'm not a doomsayer or anything, but it's it's on shaky ground. We are on shaky ground uh, because we don't have a firm footing really on anything other than what we can agree on in the moment. For us and for our faith to stand in the midst of that kind of a challenge, our faith has to be built on something solid. The people during John's time, they had to build their faith on something solid. And that solid footing is Jesus Christ. That solid footing is our relationship with him. That's why we talk so much here about making Christ the center of your life. That is where you build your life. So as we close this morning, we're going to sing. We're going to sing a song. The first words of this song read, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Period. If we could just own that, that my hope, my trust, my faith, my world is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, what he's done for us, and his righteousness that makes us okay with God. Later that song says, I wholly lean on Jesus' name. You want to have faith? You want to know that what you have is real, build your faith on Him and lean on Him. Will you stand with me? Sing this with us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but On Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his loving face, I rest on his unchanging. Stormy gale, my anchor holds with On, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All the other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come. stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Would you sing the chorus?
chorus again. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Prayer. Father, it is our prayer that as we go from here, our faith will be built on you. Our faith will be built on what Christ has done for us. That in the midst of doubt, and in the midst of worry, in the midst of a shaky world, that we will find our firm footing on who you are, on what Jesus has done. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.